Welcome to the last uh, brown bag for this uh, Archaeology and Preservation Month 2017 in Utah. I appreciate everybody coming out on the last Wednesday of May. Uh, 90 degrees outside, 50 degrees inside. Perfect day. <laughs> so I'm Chris Merritt. I work here at the Utah Division of State History. I'm a Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer. So for those of you that are really into bureaucracy, I have a really boring job in archaeology. I process a lot of paperwork, but that's okay with me because I enjoy it. It gives me a chance to look across the entire state and understand the entire state's archaeological record. Uh, so I manage uh, about eight folks. We have archaeological record staff. We have uh, folks that work with me doing process reviews. We work closely with state and federal agencies. And so my role typically every May is to wrangle the statewide events for Archaeology and Preservation Month. This year we've had 61 events in 20 counties. So when I first started trying to coordinate these statewide, I had 13 in six counties. So we have started to really increase the numbers. And so this brown bag series is something we always do here in partnership with State Archives, who allows us to use the space. Uh, but what brings me here today is something very near and dear to my heart. Uh, the story of the overseas Chinese in the United States. Uh, when I got my PhD up at the University of Montana, my focus was on the history and archaeology of the overseas Chinese experience in that state. My dissertation was the first statewide synthesis of the history, but also the archaeology of this population. When we look at the history of the Chinese in North America, most of those that arrived in the 19th and early 20th century didn't speak English, didn't write in English. And so the historical records that were written about them were written by very biased white folks that saw a very monolithic group that, and we'd like to throw a lot of racist jargon around. But there wasn't that counter narrative. There wasn't a story from the Chinese themselves, what they encountered, what they felt, what they lived in the United States. And so archeology span is that bridge. It bridges us from the written record, which is oftentimes biased and written by the victors, and that daily lived experience. Because the things that I have on the table today, a Chinese immigrant in the 19th century used. It was part of their life. And so when we find these on the ground, regardless of if it's a 12,000-year-old projectile point out in the Great Basin that was used to hunt mammoth, or a 1950s uranium camp, the artifacts that are left behind tell us a much more unbiased story of the past than the written record alone. And so I'm a historical archaeologist, so I love to fuse history and archaeology because both give us different perspectives and one can check the other or vice versa. And so after I came down to Utah in 2010, I shifted my focus. You know, I wrapped up my, my book, which is actually going to be coming out by the University of Nebraska Press in August, so it's only a couple months out. Um, thank you. That only took me six years, that's okay, after the four years of PhD before that. Um, only cried once. Uh, <laughs> but when I arrived in Utah, you know, I knew the transcontinental story. It is such a, a foundational narrative in American history. And I'm like, well, no bigger component of that was the overseas Chinese expression. But then I started poking at it. And there's no academic articles really focusing on the Chinese experience on the railroad up until the early 2000s. There was no real synthetic archaeological investigation. The hit and miss of development projects out in Box Elder County found one thing, ignored another. And so I'm like, okay. I found another focus for me to drive in on. And so through partnering with the BLM and some uh, National Park Service, we're starting to build a, a larger, robust research program. So I have a lot to talk about, and I'm a talker, so I'm going to move quickly. So I'd like to get the acknowledgments right out front. And so I appreciate Salt Lake Field Office came today to represent. Uh, they are great partners, and so they manage basically everything north of, well, Fillmore and everything west of uh, the Wasatch Mountains. So they manage a huge portion of land, including the transcontinental uh, railroad grade. In Utah, we are privileged to have the largest contiguous set of the original transcontinental railroad grade that is on public land. No state can boast as much mileage as we do. And I'll talk about why that is. But we are lucky. And that 
big part of history that we own just hasn't been fully investigated. And so Salt Lake BLM has been working really great with uh, state history and the National Park Service to bring that story up. Uh, 2014, uh, state history, which our director, Brad Westwood, is here, so I'm going to give him a shout out. Uh, we pursued a National Park Service grant to raise awareness of underrepresented communities. One component of that was to fund an archaeological inventory of the transcontinental railroad grade, specifically looking for railroad sites related to the Chinese experience. And I'm going to use some of that data in this presentation. So we got that successful. Uh, the consultant that did that is called Canon Heritage. It was Utah State University Archaeological Services, a much pithier title now. Uh, Canon Heritage Consultants did most of that work. I'd like to also thank Mike and Ann Polk, who are now retired archaeologists that have dedicated a lot of their off time to documenting these sites. Um, in 2013, also, Stanford University started the Chinese in North America, Chinese Railroad Workers in North America project. Uh, to try to bring together scholars from China, United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, to work together to do a collaborative research effort. And so this is the first time in, I, in my awareness that we're bringing Chinese historians from Guangdong to meet with archaeologists from Moscow, Idaho, and sit them in a room and talk to each other and think about what we can learn together. Because of so little of this history was left here by the Chinese in written form, we need to go overseas, back to China, to find those records. And so we've ignored the Chinese scholars in China for the last 50 years doing the research that we've done in the United States. But now we're bridging that gap, and new doors are opening. They're finding diaries. They're finding living descendants with photographs and memories. And so I think we're getting a much more clear picture of Chinese heritage in the United States by this uh, trans-Pacific partnership. And then finally, the state pays me. Thank you, Governor Herbert. Thank you, Brad Westwood, for keeping me employed. <laughs> so I want to start by laying a little bit of quick groundwork. So I'm going to boil down you know, a bachelor's degrees in China history into the next 10 minutes. So I'm going to hit some top points but you can fill in the gaps with distance learning. When we think of China, we think of the Chinese as a monolithic group. We typically in the West see them as one thing, one entity. But when you look at China from an anthropological perspective, there's 56 distinct ethnicities within 11 major language groups. Now, what that says is that there's tremendous diversity within China. This is the main language groups in China. And so the green does not speak the same language as the purple, does not speak the same language as the orange. So when we say China, we need to understand that this population is a lot more diverse than what we typically think of in the West. And so when we look at the experiences of the Chinese in the United States and Canada and overseas, we need to remember that many of these folks weren't related by family or clan. They might not have even spoke the same language or even a different dialect. And so when they got to the United States, everybody's a good racist. We're like, okay, you're all Chinese. You're all Japanese. You're all Italians. You're all Greeks. I don't care what you are. And so we have that problem when we come to the Chinese. So that's the first underline, is that they're very, very complex. When I start moving through how the Chinese arrived in the West, most of the immigration uh, came from uh, the southeast corner, where it looks like a, a shotgun of different colors. Well, those are all those different ethnicities. Those are all those different language groups and families and clans that didn't like each other. Most of the depopulation of China came from that region. So in the 19th century, we really had a mixed bag of Chinese coming to the United States and overseas. But why? Why did the Chinese leave in mass in the 19th century? Well, we got to dial the clock back to 1644. The Qing or the Manchu dynasty overthrew the dominant Han, which is the, po the main population of Southeast China. Well, what that did is it created an, an unstable political environment where a minority, a religious, ethnic, language minority was directing the politics of the majority. The proportional would be if we had in 19... 20, African Americans running the presidency and the Senate and the House when there was 80% of the population that was non-African American. It was that kind of a distinct ethnic line in China. 
Well, that instantly created friction because a lot of the infrastructure that the Qing put in place was to keep their people in power and those out of power, out of power. So that was a major issue. So almost instantly in the 1640s, we have organizations starting in China to specifically overthrow that government. And we see open rebellion a couple hundred years later. But we have these secret societies that are working in concert to throw over the, the Qing government. One of the major facets of Qing dynasty political rhetoric was, we're China, we got to everything before everybody else, gunpowder, ceramics, textiles, and silk. We don't need to trade with anybody outside China. And so they had a very isolationist political ideology. Well, when we got into the mid-19th century, right around the corner, we have the British Empire with the most advanced military in the world who had huge swaths of South Asia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, parts of Iran, Bangladesh, and they had tons and tons of product, cotton and opium. And the British Empire were good capitalists. They're like, right around the corner are 400 million consumers of our product, and the government won't let us trade. So if you have the brightest military in the world and you have a big commuter, uh, consumer product, what do you do? You attack. And so the British Empire attacked the Chinese government. And very effectively, very quickly, the Chinese government lost. The military was so out of date, almost 200 years out of date, because they hadn't kept in constant contact with other nations. And so every time the British came in contact with Chinese military, they were soundly, soundly defeated. Two repercussions came of that. One, now this growing, bubbling anger towards the government exploded in the rebellion. They said, your policies have allowed foreign powers to dictate the terms of commerce and politics in our country. Boom, that exploded. Second thing, the British Empire, the Portuguese, the French, and even the Americans carved out chunks of Eastern China to make treaty ports where really the British Empire had more political control than the Chinese government did. And so they created little fiefdoms. The British Empire did not really want to try to conquer all of China. All they wanted to do was open up that Walmart storefront and then let their consumer products flow into the country. And they did that. And so that all led to open rebellion, all this discontent. So between 1850 and 1864, we have what's called the series of Taiping rebellions. There's many rebellions within that. And it was centered in those, that man or that Han population, dominant ethnic group, largely peasant farmers. That's where the rebellion started. And it swept throughout interior China. And you can see the numbers, 20 million dead. In 1850, the entire population of the United States was a little over 20 million. So really, the, the population of the United States would have been killed in the Chinese Civil War during this period. And then you have another 30 million that were dispossessed. The Qing government, to try to crush this rebellion, had a scorched earth policy, which meant if a village had any sort of sign of rebellion, the government troops would come in, burn it to the ground. The crops, the houses, everything. And then they would move to the next village, and the next village. And so for over 4,000 years, many of these villages had been the real center of social life. Uh, the land ownership would go from person to person down a family. And so your land came from your great, 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 great grandfathers. Now you had nothing. You had no land. You had no way to support your family. And so you were refugees. To put this in context, Ireland, one of the greatest mass exoduses of all time, there was four million people in Ireland. Two million left. One million died. Tw 20 million died in China and 30 million left China. That is a dramatically staggering figure. And it was all because of this internal distrust of the government and internal conflict. So where did they go? Anywhere. Those refugees moved into these port cities that are now being controlled by foreign powers because that was the only place they could find economic opportunity, working in factories, working in shipping, working in markets. And then when those jobs filled up, there was lots of folks that say, hey, 
We have sugar plantations. We have pineapple plantations. We have copper mines opening. And so that huge population that had no economic vitality in China left. 30 million, potentially, between 1850 and 1900 left China. The first, they moved into Indonesia. They moved into Australia and New Zealand. Anywhere that they could find a, a paying job that they could support their family back in China. Most of them were men, married or single, that left because they were the main wage earners in Chinese society. And so they left, moving out. The first Chinese to arrive in North America, we believe, was about 1849, 1850, right at the major uh, hit of the gold rush in California. Because think about it. That was your lived experience. Civil war, loss of your homeland, loss of any chance for a job, and someone in the newspaper says, you can pull gold right out of the river. Where do you think you want to go? You're going to go there. And that was the same story that drove them to Australia or New Zealand with the gold strikes. They went to South America and worked in copper mines. They went to Havana, Cuba and worked in tobacco factories, rolling cigars. They went to Hawaii. Uh, planting and harvesting pineapple. They went to sugar plantations in the Caribbean, in the postbellum South. They worked in rice plantations. Anywhere that there was an opportunity, the Chinese went. And the United States, about 1850. But we always have to worry about those immigrants, those pesky immigrants. They're going to take our jobs. They're going to take our houses. So the federal government very quickly saw the danger of potentially 30 million immigrants coming to the United States, almost the population of the United States by 1870. They're like, we need to control this. So in 1868, the British or the uh, American government signed the Burlingame Treaty with the Chinese government. Even though the Chinese government didn't have a lot of control, they tried. What that said is that only men could immigrate to the United States. Well, why is that? Class participation time. <laughs> yeah, they just needed work. If you bring your wife and children, the chances of you staying increase. So let's just not have them bring their women and children. And so that was a very successful policy when you look at it from an immigration perspective. This really set up the next 30 years of Chinese-American relations. In the 1870s, 1872-73, we see a big economic collapse in the United States. We saw it because of a lot of railroad-related um, backdoor deals and Halliburton-like fun where the government was getting kickbacks from the construction of the railroads and congressmen are sitting on the board of directors of these companies getting federal money. You know, it was a huge, big scandal. And so in the 1870s, that came out, economy, economy crashed nationwide. Well, you know what happens when the economy crashes? You start looking for a fall guy. And they said, you know what? Those Chinese, they're coming here, they're taking our jobs, they're coming here illegally, they are sending the money back to China. And so those three things were the calling card of the 1870s anti-Chinese movement. This all coalesced in 1882. Throughout the 1870s, they tried several times to pass federal legislation to further restrict Chinese immigration, but it didn't always pass because of lots of Democrats in the West wanted that free Chinese labor to fl flow into California so they could use it. And so 1882, the Exclusion Act passes. This is the first major sweeping immigration legislation in American history, targeting a specific ethnic group. So it took the Burlingame Act and then made it a big federal law saying not only women and children can't come, no laboring class Chinese person can come to the United States. The excluded classes were scholars, diplomats, and acrobats. Those were the only three that could avoid uh, persecution. So everybody loved that act, except the corporations that needed a lot of labor. And so you'll see how this plays out in the railroad when I get to it in here in a minute. 1892, so the Chinese Exclusion Act passed for 10 years. At the 10-year renewal point, Everyone sat around in Congress like, this is awesome. We have basically destroyed the Chinese population in the United States. Let's do more. So even the ones that are here, let's try to get them out. And so the Geary Act was a re-uppance of the Exclusion Act and was the first major federal legislation requiring a photo ID to be acquired by all immigrants. 
and it was targeted at the Chinese. And so you had to go to a federal courthouse, register any Chinese currently living in the United States, and get a photograph of yourself, and you had to carry your papers all the time. If you're caught without your papers, deportation. So in Montana, where I did most of my work, there was no federal courthouse in Montana in 1892. So if you lived in Helena, you had to find the money to go to Idaho to go get this photo ID taken. So many Chinese went underground. They couldn't register even if they could get to the courthouse because they didn't have the money to get there. Um, many of those secret societies that worked in China said, you know, let's not try to get you registered because if you're on one of the government rolls, they'll find you. And so there was a lot of that internal politics too. 1892 passed, woo, everybody celebrates except for the Chinese. 1902, it's reauthorized again. 1912, everyone said, this is working out so great that we want to apply it to the Japanese and the Greeks and the Italians. But let's take care of this Chinese once and for all. So they made a 100-year passage of the Geary Act in 1912. So no Chinese immigration. But here is the impact. In Montana, in 1870, one out of 10 Montanans were of Chinese birth. So in this room, there would have been five of you that would have been from China. If you're in Helena, Montana in 1870, one out of five of you would have been Chinese. That's a major population. Go to 1900, one out of about 40,000 Montanans were Chinese. So if you look at this law, just purely from its purpose and effect, it is probably the most successful immigration law in the history of the United States. Was it based purely on racist, capitalistic ideals? Oh yeah. But in its nature, it was very successful in doing exactly what it needed to do, controlling Chinese populations in the United States. Average age of a Chinese man in 1870 Montana was 24. The average age of a Chinese man in 1930 was 90 because there was no new population coming in. There were so many stories in Montana in the 1920s and 30s of these elderly 70, 80 year old Chinese men dying. And they would always, the news reporters would love to talk to them. Like, oh, what was your life like in the United States? I'm like, well, I left China in 1875. I was married with two children. This is now 1926. I have never seen my wife and children since because I never could make the money to go home. And that story played out over and over again. The Montana press loved it. All these cute little Chinese guys are dying and the last of their, their race in the United States. But the impacts of that legislation are heartbreaking. So many people left their families never to see them again. But every month they would send a check home to make sure that their family was being taken care of. The doors that Stanford University has opened up has shown the impact of those dollars that went back to China. Many of these villages have temples built from the funds sent back by these Chinese in Montana, Idaho, Utah. Um, and they have their name on there. And so, you know, this, this legislation has been pretty damaging to the Chinese. The Chinese population in Montana in 1940 was 27-ish. After about 3,000 was the max in 1890. Up until about 1970, they didn't get back to that 500 level. So the impacts of this early 20th century legislation has been pretty dramatic. But in 1943, we decided, you know what, that pesky Exclusion Act and all its issues, we should repeal that. Why? We needed their help in World War II. And the Chinese government, like, hey, you racist. <laughs> you want to lo lower that and we'll help you. And the United States government did. Oh, I love this one. This came from a newspaper in Virginia City, Nevada in the 1870s. But come, everyone, join the grand, democratic, anti-Chinese torchlight demonstration. Sounds grand and democratic to me. <laughs> um, 1870s and 1880s saw widespread violence against the Chinese throughout the West. Salt Lake had a race riot against the Chinese in the 1870s. Rock Springs, Wyoming, coal miners killed dozens of Chinese that were working in the coal mines by locking them in their houses and burning it to the ground. Um, Denver basically killed its Chinatown in the 1880s. Tacoma, Washington forced 500 Chinese out in one major race riot. So the effects weren't just purely legislative. They were against people. And so when we look at the experience of the Chinese that worked in Utah, I just wanted to lay that groundwork a little bit. I've already talked a little bit 
most of the Montana Chinese went into placer mining, which is that free milling gold that comes out of streams and creeks. Uh, they typically were barred from working underground because underground workings had a lot of labor influence. And labor unions didn't want Chinese becoming involved because then they couldn't control labor costs. So they just basically said every mining district that was formed, no Chinese to work underground. What that has led to in the 1970s and 80s, many historians saying that the Chinese were scared to work underground. I'm like, no, they were barred from doing that. Uh, so railroads, I'll talk about that for the rest of this. Gardens, many rural mining towns in the American West, the, the white dudes that were there to make gold did not care about fresh food and produce. They were there to make gold and silver and go home. And so the Chinese, largely farmers by background, said, hey, we can fill this niche. So a lot of these little towns had garden plots that the Chinese would grow crops, sell it to the, the miners and the oh. restaurants in town. Utah had some of those. Most of Utah's uh, agriculturalists from the Asian perspective were more Japanese truck farmers in the 1890s going forward. But if you're up in Montana, you couldn't pull an old Sanborn map without seeing a Chinese garden somewhere in that community. Uh, and then obviously they worked in factories, making shoes in Seattle, Washington, making cigars in Havana, Cuba, uh, sugar refining in Hawaii. So anywhere that there was an opportunity, they went. This is one of the coolest photos I found over at Denver Public Library. It is the best picture I have ever found of Chinese workers in Utah. You can actually see their faces. Most of them are very distant shots where they just kind of meld into the background. The way many of the railroads hired the Chinese was just one China foreman, 20 China men. That's what they would put in the ledger books. So the individual stories are completely just washed into the background. But these faces tell me something. The census records that I went through said something else. 1870, the youngest Chinese railroad worker in the United States was up in Box Elder County, age 14. He was a section hand, which means that he was laying ties, he was loading rails, he was doing ballast work, 20 miles between any other human, him and five of six of his buddies. 14 years old, working 10 hour shifts, six hours a day, or six days a week. Dramatic kind of work that these folks did. So, for this one, yeah, it was like one of their, they had a whole series, I don't know, off the top of my head. Yeah, it was a railroad photographer, he traveled the line trying to sell photographs in his little studio that was inside the boxcar. Um, so three major United States railroads were built largely on the back of Chinese labor. The Central Pacific Railroad, of which runs through Utah, Nevada, and California, was the first, but not the only. The Northern Pacific Railroad in Montana, Idaho, uh, and Washington used huge amounts of Chinese labor in the 1880s, right before the passage of the Exclusion Act. Southern Pacific Railroad, down in the southern part of the country, same thing. Big groups of Chinese being directly imported for the use of the railroad companies. There is a very elaborate economic and employment scheme going on between these big railroad companies, Chinese labor producers, and then China itself to make sure that these uh, were fulfilled. So that's where we transition into Utah's story, which is really Utah's, Nevada's, and California's story. We all know the famous story, the Transcontinental Railroad, the first linking of East and West, pushed largely at the last moment because of the American Civil War and the Union feeling, oh, we might lose the West, so let's make sure we tie it together. Well, the Central Pacific from Sacramento to Promontory Point in central, North Central Utah used the bulk of the Chinese labor for construction. This is a, a little uh, shot showing the Humboldt Plains in western Nevada. And you can see the majority of the workers in this picture are Chinese. They're wearing that classic sort of straw hat. Um, early on, 1862, 63, 64, the bulk of the labor that the railroad companies tried to use was local. They tried to use Euro-American local labor. It just wasn't getting the numbers they needed and the production they needed. So we see by the mid-1860s, these railroad companies looking elsewhere. So we have a note from Leland Stanford, the namesake of Stanford University. And this is a letter he wrote um, to one of his um, remembrances. But I just want to highlight a couple of things for you. So he's speaking to the Chinese, and they were asking him, why did you hire so many Chinese? 
We find them organized into societies for mutual aid and assistance. These societies can count their numbers by thousands, are conducted by shrewd, intelligent, intelligent businessmen who promptly advise their subordinates where employment can be made on most favorable terms. No system similar to slavery, serfdom, or peonage prevails among these laborers. Well, that captures that the Chinese as a labor force were well organized. They had local Chinese organizers that knew where the employment opportunities, the Leland Stanford would say, I need 10,000. He would give it to these labor organizers. He would get his 10,000. This was the most elaborate employment scheme in the American West. And these railroad companies needed that labor. Then the next one, uh, in the next year, so this is 1865, it will be able to procure during the next year not less than 15,000 laborers. 15,000 laborers is an amazing number for any undertaking. But this was just the Chinese component of the Transcontinental Railroad construction. When we look at a uh, testimony by Stowbridge, who was the construction foreman for the Central Pacific Railroad, he gives a little bit more nuanced numbers. But this was him under testimony in Congress. But 1865, 7,000 Chinese, 66, 67, 11,000, 68, 5 to 6,000, 1869, when it was completed, 5,000. Now that not necessarily means even a consistent 5,000. So potentially 20,000, 30,000 Chinese could have circled through the transcontinental railroad building effort from Sacramento to Promontory Point. The Union Pacific Railroad built from Omaha West used a lot of Irish labor, they used a lot of Eastern European labor, uh, but after construction, almost all the maintenance was done by Chinese labor into the 1880s. The Chinese had shown themselves to be an organized workforce. It's a cultural thing. Irish are Euro-American. We're out for number one. You might have bonded with other Irishmen, but you really cared about your own personal prosperity. The Chinese, because of a more cultural-based uh, solidarity, they are used to working in groups, used to working in common labor. And so the railroads were able to exploit that. They said, these folks work really well together. There's always internal strife. There always is. You throw 10 guys in a room with a bunch of booze, something bad's going to happen. Um, and so, yeah, Ray. I'm surprised that they're uh, paid the same amount as the whites. Um, did they uh, negotiate? Uh, did they organize to negotiate labor rates? Yeah, the first, railroad spy, or the, the first railroad strike in American history was the Chinese on a really horrific stretch of the Nevada line. And so they actually were able to get their pay up. I do want to say that these numbers are testimony. The real numbers off the ledger's book don't show this to be such an equitable pay arrangement. So Stowbridge was cooking the numbers for Congress to make it look like a little bit better option. So the white pay... So that $35 a month included room and board. You were getting paid, you were getting free room and board. The 30 over here, you had to pay for your own room, you had to pay for your own food. So again, they cut that out. And you know, the railroad company's like, well, they don't wanna eat the food we're gonna provide. They don't wanna live in the boxcars we're gonna provide for tenting. But in reality, they were saying, yeah, we paid you the same rate, but you didn't get the same uh, benefits of employment. And that old adage that the Chinese didn't get sick on the railroad because they boiled tea is absolutely true. The Irish eating nothing but beef and beer and water out of the creeks got sick in great numbers. I'm looking at you, Mike Sheehan. You and I, you and I are Irish, so we can say this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Especially Nevada alkali water, right? But the Chinese, they would typically start a giant 50-gallon drum of hot water in the morning, fill it with tea, and throughout the day, they'd walk up and down the line giving cups of tea out. And so it boiled out the bacteria. It boiled out a lot of the, the bad things that were getting the Irish and other workers sick. So that adage, as much as it sounds like a stereotype, it actually was true. Um, this is one of the few construction camp photos we have from the period. This was found out of Stanford University by Mike Polk, but it shows the grade under construction on the right and then this small rolling tent community on the left. The archaeology shows that these two areas were completely segregated. The white camp and the Chinese camp were segregated on the ground. Uh, that was both personal preference and also the railroad, keeping them separate. 
Um, there's a lot of stories of the Irish sneaking into the Chinese camp and blowing up their tents with powder and then the Chinese going back. It doesn't bear out in the historical record. Of course there was conflict between the groups, but nothing as elaborate as Hollywood would like you to believe. You know, these folks were working 10, 11 hours a day doing very hard manual labor. Last thing you want to do is crawl around at midnight blowing each other up. So, at least that's my hypothesis. <laughs> What was interesting is that once the railroad closed, that typically where we stopped talking about the story. You know, once it was completed, all right, it's a railroad, yay. No, it had to completely maintain itself. Even when they completed in 1869, the first thing they had to go do is backwork all the things they put together too quickly. Because they were trying to push for speed and efficiency, not for high class engineering. And so as soon as that golden spike was laid, there were already crews working backwards into Nevada and backwards into Wyoming to improve all those ballasts and trestles that were slipshod as quick as they could. And the Chinese found their labor to be the most coveted by the railroad, regardless of where it was on this line. And so what I'm going to talk about largely now is the maintenance. So there's the transcontinental line cutting through the north side of um, the Great Salt Lake and all the way into Wyoming. This picture, including all of Nevada, the maintenance camps, the sidings were largely Chinese labor from 1870 into the mid-1890s. By the mid-1890s, the effect of that legislation started hitting. So the railroad companies are like, okay, well, we can't keep hiring these Chinese because now they're getting older and we can't get any new ones. What are we going to do? Let's call the next ones Japanese. So they start importing the Japanese by tens of thousands. And then the federal government tries to restrict them. Like, okay, let's bring in the Greeks and Italians. So any cheap labor they could get, they just kept cycling through. So in Utah, those are the main towns on that line from the Nevada border over to Promontory into Ogden. The main towns, Lucin, Terrace, Colton, and Corinne, these were areas that the railroad had large shop facilities, round houses, boiler houses, you know, things to do large scale maintenance of the railroad engines. But those were spaced fairly, fairly equal distant. In between, you have all these little sidings that might have consisted of three to four buildings, maybe 15 guys. And those maintained about a 10 mile track on either side of that siding. So really you were 20 miles apart from the next population of 15 people. Who's been out to northwest side of the Great Salt Lake? More of you need to go because it feels 1869 out there. And imagine being a Chinese person, not speaking any English, your foreman, so there's 15 of you, one of him, an Irish guy, because the railroad companies didn't trust Chinese foremen. So one Irish guy, 15 Chinese, 20 miles apart in the middle of nowhere. Now that is a sitcom if you ask me. <laughs> but that was reality for 30 years for these folks working out there. So I went through the census records page by page and pulled out some demographics. So in 1870, uh, this number is a little bit skewed because there's a few pages in the Nevada census that are missing. Nevada had a much longer trackage than Utah did, so their population should be a little higher. But there was about 350 Chinese railroad workers in Utah, all of them in Box Elder County, well, with the exception of maybe 15 or 20 in the very northwest corner of Weber County. Um, by the time we get to 1880, Nevada's numbers show up. That's a little bit skewed just largely because of it, but the population's gone down. But 1870 represents that major rebuilding of the railroad effort after it's completed. They need a lot of labor to do that. By 1880, that was probably a more accurate number of who they just needed to keep on to maintain. Because you had to replace about half the railroad ties per mile every year, so that's about 1,200 railroad ties a year you had to pull out, uh, rebalance the line, pull the ties or the uh, rail off. So you needed labor. 1900, you see, there's about five Chinese in Utah. Well, if I would have calculated that against Italians, Greeks, and Japanese, we would have gotten back to those 1880s numbers. The railroads had already switched over to different forms of labor. Um, average age. 1870, average age, around 26, 27. 1880, get a little older. You're feeling that effects of that legislation already and that sort of anti-Chinese immigration. So you see an average age of 30. By the time you get to 1900, it's up in its 40s. And most of those 40-year-olds had now 20 to 30 years of service on the railroad line. So that tells you they came over in their teens and were still working that railroad. So I'm going to quickly walk you through some, some of the major sites, the shiny pictures. 
Terrace. Beautiful, booming town of Terrace there. There, there are two children. One's probably Mike. This is from your period, right? So this is looking downtown Terrace. This is the largest town on the transcontinental line from Nevada up to Corinth. And so it had dozens of businesses, upwards of potentially 1,000 people. After the 1904 cutoff, where they bypassed the line going around the north end of the lake, this town turned into that. Nothing. Those are the foundation pits for all those businesses right there. The standing structures at Terrace are gone. Most of them were picked up, moved by the railroad, and what wasn't picked up and moved, ranchers probably hauled off. Um, so it's really a bleak landscape. But to an archaeologist, it's fabulous. Terrace Roundhouse, really nice little photo here. There it is today, almost the same perspective. You see the bays for the railroad engines, just completely erased from the landscape. Honestly, if there wasn't a, a little BLM sign out there and you didn't know you were driving on the Transcontinental Railroad grade, you wouldn't even know this town exists. But the artifacts out there are incredible. Mm -hmm. Nope. The turntable still exists. There's a nice big, nice big pit. Um, but yeah, the actual subterranean. And Brad, thank you for the segue. All of what I'm going to show you today is just surface finds. We do not excavate historic period sites in Utah because there is no museum that will take those materials. So it has really taken the knees out of archaeology in this state. We are one of the only states in the entire nation that we don't have a repository that will take historic period artifacts. As a historical archaeologist, that keeps me up every single night. Because you think I want to drop some holes in these sites? You think I want to do some awesome public archaeology field schools? Hell yeah, I do. But I can't. Because if this stuff gets excavated, the next place it goes is the dump. Because there's no federal repository for that to go. So welcome to Utah. So there's the roundhouse, and this is one field visit we did with Canon Heritage Consultants. Within five minutes, we found Chinatown. Uh, we found upper left bamboo style bowl, which I'll pass around. So I'm just gonna start a few artifacts around. These are archeological artifacts. So drop them if you want. I'll glue them back together. On the upper left is a very basic um, Chinese workers bowl. That is a bamboo style bowl. That was what every Chinese laborer would have on him. He probably had one bowl for his life. Uh, that on the bottom left is actually a fragment of a ginger jar. So they imported dried ginger in these little nice little hexagonal stoneware vessels. And then on the right is the uh, four flowers pattern, which tends to be a little bit pricier on the economic scale. So it's either someone that worked for a long time, saved up enough money, or maybe some signs of a foreman or signs of someone with a, a restaurant or a merchant that could afford a little bit nicer wares. Here's another example. This is the siding of Matlin, which is another little town. Great sign from the 1980s, still hanging out there. Is this one you guys replaced? Yeah, they're all gone, we replaced them. Don't yeah. Check anyone. Yeah, definitely go out there. The new interpretive signs are great, so thank you guys for that. Uh, this is actually a plat. The Southern Pacific Railroad, who took over operations of this line, went through and standardized all those siding houses in the 1880s. But what's great, in these old plan books, they say China House, China Cookhouse. There were building facilities specifically for the Chinese working on the railroad, which I find fascinating. And so this is the Chinese bunkhouse they're pointed out with the arrow, and that's what Matlin looks like today. So it would have had those buildings, about four buildings, uh, in that little space. That road is the railroad grade, built in 1868. So you, you drive a good portion of it today. At Matlin, uh, Mike Polk did find this. It's a bamboo style bowl, and it actually has the Chinese characters engraved into its base. So if you have one bowl for your life and everybody's bowl looks exactly the same, you put your initials in it. And so this tells that very personal story. This was a person's bowl, not the Chinese bowl. And so those are the kinds of artifacts we love to find in archaeology. This is no longer this abstract idea. This is a person, which is the part of archaeology that I love. Bovine, very elaborate name for another sighting. Uh, these pictures come from Ken Cannon, who was doing the work out there. Uh, another smattering of Chinese ceramics, all those are bamboo style. 
On the right is the Chinese cookhouse, or what's left of it. All those buildings have long since gone away. But this is the map that Ken Cannon produced after his archaeological fieldwork. What you can see here are all the dots or individual artifacts plotted. All those orange dots in the bottom left and on the bottom right, those are Chinese-specific artifacts. So those are like what I'm passing around here today. What that shows is that the artifacts cluster right where those plans should say that Chinese cookhouse is and that Chinese bunkhouse is. On the other side of the railroad grade is where the Irish guy lived in the section house. And you can see almost no Chinese artifacts on that side of the railroad. So segregated workforce being represented on the ground by archaeology. That is pretty cool. Okay, Ambe, another one that uh, Ken Cannon used our, our Park Service funds to go survey. See a lid of an opium can there. I'll pass that around here in a minute. And then they use this really fancy um, total station equipment to map in very high accurate uh, locations of all the artifacts. That's how we produce those maps. Well, not the royal we archaeologists, smarter people than I am. So this is another picture. So you see the railroad grade cutting from that sort of top left to the bottom right. On the left, nice concentration of those orange, the Chinese artifacts. On the right, that's where the section house was, where the Irish foreman was. Not a lot of Chinese stuff. So this was really starting to tell us the story of the past. So how did all this end? In 1904, Utah was the scene for the next major accomplishment in American history. One of the longest open overwater trestles in human history was constructed dead straight across the Great Salt Lake. And that cut off all that jiggy-jagging around the north end of the Great Salt Lake. Cut 100 miles off the route. Cut hours off the transit. Well, what that did is made that line from Lucin on the west side of the lake and all that blue almost obsolete especially the blue line up until the dead point center of the, the lake because the other lines were going up into Montana and Idaho. So that operated very loosely into the 1940s. Ranchers would use it to load up cattle, load up horses, maybe some uh, wheat, and send it back to the main line for market. But really it wasn't used anymore. The Chinese kept going down. Even the Japanese, Italians, and Greeks started dwindling. They just didn't need a big labor force. 1942, Railroads, okay, we're pulling it. All the ties, or the majority of the, the ties were repurposed for uh, the war effort, and the, the rails were melted down for the war effort. So if you drive out there today, the only thing you're going to find are lots of railroad spikes, which are great for tires. Uh, but that killed that line. After 1942, when that line was killed, all that land reverted back to who gave it to them, the General Land Office, or now the BLM. And so that's why we have the majority of that line is on BLM land because it reverted back to its original ownership, public domain. So we are lucky to have such a huge segment of intact railroad grade on the property. Mike Polk went through all the Southern Pacific bulletins, which is the railroad company that took over operation of that line. And they did like an employee newsletter kind of thing throughout the 19-teens and 20s. He went through it page by page and found the stories of these four guys. None of them, we can tell, worked on the original railroad grade. Most of them were maintenance crews. But you can just see the level of effort. So AHOP, which AH is just basically a less formal f f version of Mr. Like AH is not a name, uh, but it was very common in Western society to say AHOP. But he started in 1871 for the Southern Pacific Railroad, retired in 1920 after 49 years of service. And the majority of that was that hard, back-breaking labor that a section crew would be doing, relaying ties and rails. The dramatic one is the, just the, the scope. Every one of these guys, 43 years, 47 years, 28 years, 28 years, 30 years, over 50 years for Anand which is spellings in context. We're not sure what his actual name was. But 50 years plus working for the railroad. Can anyone imagine working for your employer for 50 years and you get a nice watch and your picture in the bulletin? Yay. <laughs> but these faces are one of the very few faces that we know of people that worked on the Salt Lake Division of this railroad. So many of these people are faceless because we just don't have the records. And so we were pretty, pretty excited to find these artifacts, or these photos. So I'm going to start a couple more objects around. 
But I want to talk very briefly, and I appreciate our partners from Salt Lake Field Office coming through. But we're doing a lot of work right now on celebrating the 20th or the 150th anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad, which will be in 2019. And so we're partnering with the Salt Lake Field Office, trying to get the Park Service involved. There was some legislation in the last legislative session to make this working group to do a cohesive effort to celebrate not just the Chinese contributions to the railroad, which is my little angle on it, but everyone's contribution. Those LDS Mormon railroad workers that did most of the track lane from the boundaries of Wyoming to Promontory, the Irish, the, the ranchers, everybody that contributed to that railroad. So we're working towards that effort. We're continuing to do additional archeological inventories. Uh, the Salt Lake Field Office is going through and documenting every culvert and trestle from loose end to promontory uh, that's still extant. When you drive out there, you're driving on grade that hasn't really been messed with since the 40s and on features that haven't probably been replaced since the 1870s. So don't try to Baja over those trestles, by the way. Um, we're also, I'm actually going down tomorrow to work with the BLM a little bit on doing some work on the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad, which came out of Grand Junction up the Price River Valley to uh, Price. Well, they used huge Chinese labor on that effort too, on the narrow gauge line. So we're going to see if we can find some comparative sites down there. And the BLM now internally is finding money to support these efforts because people are starting to get a little interested in this Chinese history and the little story that has been largely forgotten. And then assessment and stabilization of the built environment. And I just want to highlight this photo here. These guys at the Salt Lake Field Office went out and they noticed that there are some scary things happening to these potentially 1870s trestles out in Box Elder County. So this one, you can see Don Hartley's down in the weeds, as he always is. <laughs> oh, is he in here? No. Um, but they're looking at this trestle and you can see on this one, my slideshow. So, the ground level should be almost even with the base of that trestle. All that soil has been blown out because someone in their wisdom put a culvert on the uphill side, not looking at you, Mike, personally, <laughs> um, put it on the uphill side and then funneled all that rainwater like a fire hose right at the base of this trestle, <laughs> where for 140 years it worked just fine. But someone said, we need to put in a culvert. Come on, Jimmy. And so they put in a culvert. Well, that destroyed all that soil underneath it. And so these guys have gone back out, and I think that one you've put soil back in to, to compact it. There was a second trussel that actually came loose from both ends of the grade and was teeter-tottering. And so these guys have now weighted down one end, packed in the other end, and now it's pretty stable. Probably going to stay that way for a while. But how many trussels you got out there? So these are two success stories. And so the BLM to try to find money to support those efforts is difficult. But they're doing what they can with the resources they have. And so the more partners we can get, the more interest we can get on that railroad, the more of this preservation effort we can do. This is pretty cool. This is a stone culvert. In my estimation, I bet this is 6970. You know, I bet this is early construction period rock work. And it still functions. Don could crawl in there, but there was a skunk. Um, I crawled through a different one. There was no skunk. Um, yeah, even I crawled through one of those. So these are big suckers. But these tell you the story of that labor in a way that a book can't, a photo can't. You can go out there and experience the 1870s by driving this grade. And I find that to be the best part of my job, if not the best part of being a person interested in history. Okay, very quickly. And I told you I talked too long, so I'm going to go talk quickly. I brought some Chinese artifacts. All the things on this table came from China on a boat, landed probably in Sacramento or San Francisco, loaded on a railroad, hauled all the way to Corinne, Utah, and then probably hauled up into Idaho and Montana by freight wagon because the Chinese had a lot of artifacts that they wanted to have. They felt more comfortable with items they're familiar with. And so they had imported dates and and pickled duck eggs, and uh, dried fish, and powdered ginger, and bean sprouts, and bean curd, all imported from China to Ambe, to bovine. And it's amazing the chain of economics that we can see on this table. So very quickly, 
This is the Kamwa Chung store up in Oregon. So I took some photos when I had to move my family up there. So I'm like, yeah, shows these artifacts in context. This is a Chinese store up in central Oregon, kind of showing how a kitchen would be laid out. Bamboo style, cheapest, only came in rice bowl format. And you've all, all touched those. Uh, it's bamboo because of the pattern. Double happiness, that was the smaller little piece, had little squiggles on it. It's a double happiness character in Chinese. And so these are a little pricier. They had a little bit more variation, but largely just a rice bowl. Four flowers, four seasons, which I've passed around now, that came in the whole set. Bowls, platters, saucers, cups. And it was a little pricier because all the pattern has been hand painted onto the vessel. And so on the exterior of the glaze. So it's a little fancier. You see the flat bottom spoons like you'd probably still see in a Chinese restaurant today. Celadon, one of the easiest things for, for me to train people to look for on an archeological site because nothing else looks like this. The glaze is very unique. Um, it's actually a emperor style glaze that became commonplace in the 19th century. The commoners started using it for their vessels. Um, but largely came in bowls, but you also have some saucers and flat bottom spoons. You see that great maker's mark. An archeologist always looks smart when they're like, oh yeah, that's a Taylor Knowles and Taylor, 1882 to 1883. It's like, yeah, because there's a maker's mark on there. <laughs> well, Chinese, the, many of the workers in the pottery factories were illiterate. And so it was a giant game of the telephone. And so there would be one person that was literate, put the name of the pottery shop on the vessel, and then you know a hundred people that didn't know understand or didn't understand Chinese would then copy it, and so you, it lost all its meaning. Mm -hmm. It became just art, and so that's kind of hindered where these artifacts are coming from within China. So we have to look other ways to do it. Uh, brown glazed stoneware, the Tupperware of the Chinese world, the canned goods of the Chinese world. All the dried vessels that would come over, all the, the food way, the food goods, rice, powdered ginger, dried ginger, crushed herbs, all of that would come in brown glazed stoneware produced in China by hand. All these are hand thrown. Globular jars, big jars, about this big, about this big around, probably rice. You wouldn't find these typically on a, a small site. You'd probably find them in a store setting where they would be selling individual portions out. A lot of these were used to ship uh, Chinese skeletons back to China. Many of the Chinese that died in America did not want their remains to stay here because there was none of their relatives to look out for them. And so they would pay a contract to, if I die, you'll dig up my remains and send me home. And so they would oftentimes use these vessels once they're empty to send them back to China. Spouted jar, 1986, 1890, 3,000 years old. The shape of this has not changed in 3,000 years. Perhaps some of its manufacturing, like this is obviously a machine made to mold, but the spout's still handmade, and this is from the 1980s. You can actually see the markings where this archeologist bought it in a Chinatown. When we're trying to date these, maybe not that easy. This was typically soy sauce or spouted jars, what we typically call it because it could have also had vegetable oil, it could have had other types of distilled uh, vinegars. Liquor jars, so this is rice wine, sorghum wine, sorghum whiskey, any sort of distilled spirit that came out of China came in these side of vessels, same as that guy. Shape hasn't really changed in 3,000 years. They figured it out, why change? This came from a Chinatown sometime between 1935 and 1962, given that it has the federal law for bids printed on it, which the federal government required on liquor vessels from the Great Depression of the 60s. So even the Chinese had to put that on their liquor bottles. Uh, this is a 19th century, and when I pass them around side by side, you can see how the glaze is different, almost like an oil sheen on the glaze of this. And if you look at the inside, you can still see where the hand-thrown uh, thumbprints are on the inside of the, the neck of these vessels. Coinage? Chinese brought coinage that was 400 years old to the United States. I always loved doing a talk in Montana and saying, this is the oldest historic artifact in the state of Montana. This is a 1675 coin. And people would go, ooh, the Chinese beat everyone here? I'm like, no. This thing was in <laughs> circulation for 300 years. Um, the Chinese would keep these coinage largely for um, religious purposes, folklorish purposes, good luck charms, gambling. And so these things kept in circulation for a long time. These came off the Northern Pacific Railroad up in Western Montana. And you can see Chinese coins, Vietnamese coins, and Japanese coins, all on the same site. Well, it's not because there was Vietnamese, you know, Japanese and Chinese, or like, these are all Chinese guys, but they used the same coins because you see that square hole. And that square hole had a lot of meaning. 
you know, the devil is greedy, so he'd have to fly through all the holes and his feet would get stuck. So if you want to keep him away from you, put a lot of coins out. Same as you would throw it at a funeral procession to keep the devil or bad spirits away from you. So that's why they kept those. Medicine bottles, a lot of people call these opium bottles. Opium didn't come in bottles. Think of opium as molasses. Do you want to try to get molasses out of a bottle this big? Nope. <laughs> So these are medicine bottles. This is herbal medicine. And so these are kind of single dose prescription bottles. You go to your Chinese herbalist, he's like, hey, I'm gonna use that joke again. So, hey, Jessica, what's your problem? Oh, you know, I have hemorrhoids. I'm like, well, <laughs> well, you're a pain in my ass too. <laughs> we know each other too well. Um, but you would go in, say what your ailment, and then the doctor on the spot would concoct a remedy from all the herbal thing he had available to, to help out your hemorrhoids or whatever was ailing you, or probably a busted head when I get out of here. But this is the, the Chinese herbalist in John Day, Oregon. This is his setup. You can see a bear paw, a dried lizard. There was over 400 herbs and different concoctions that he had in his herbalist area, and it was the size of a closet. But anything you could come in with, cook it up, put it in a little ball, put it in that bottle, seal it with wax, and here you go. Take two of these, call me later. Apparently these all tasted foul. Gaming was very commonplace. Uh, you had a lot of recreation time, and you had a lot of downtime. So gaming was a very popular tradition. So these are gaming pieces, Wei Chi or Go pieces, that I found in a Chinese restaurant in Big Timber, Montana. Uh, Chinese dominoes and dye from a Riverside Chinatown in San Jose. This is inside that Kamwa Chung store, a cigar box full of Chinese dominoes and go pieces because you'd have to have a full set to play, so they kept them on hand. And go and Wei Chi is kind of like an elaborate game of Othello. We're trying to capture territory. Opium, and I just want to preface this very quickly. In the West, we have a very dark image of opium smoking. It's a drug. In China, the meaning and use of opium is truly comparable to alcohol. When we think of the American West and we think of those rowdy miners drinking at the bars and saloons, you didn't see Chinese in those circumstances. The Chinese culturally didn't drink a lot of alcohol as their way of recreating. Some of them used opium. But any culture, if you have violence, depravity, loss of life, loss of civilization, immigration, every bad thing that can happen to you, is there a propensity for maybe you to hit drugs and alcohol harder than others? Yep, that's a normal for cultures. So after opium wars, after the British Empire opened up China to opium, is when we see China really starting to have a problem with opium smoking. It wasn't until the British Empire forced their way in. Chinese smoking of opium, they've done it for thousands of years, but it was done communally, it was done in a public setting, uh, recreationally, and it wasn't done to excess, except by those very few that had a problem. Same as alcohol. If you drink at home by yourself on the couch watching Oprah, you know, typically American society says you have a problem. <laughs> I say have a good Saturday. But <laughs> same as opium. If you did it in a communal setting, with friends, with, with conversation, with all this, it was seen as a social norm. And so in the West, we have this really dark image of opium smoking, but to the Chinese, it was much more of a recreational activity, same as going to a bar. You hang out, you relax. I, I hold off the opium till the end here. Opium came in cans, brass cans, not bottles. And so I'll start this tray around real quick. So, even though they're in a tray, you can touch them, you can fondle them. What we have on this tray is an opium can and some opium pipe bowls. Opium cans, we've gotten a pretty good dial in on. They actually have a maker's mark on them. They have a brand name. Like I want, you know, good luck brand opium because that's the good stuff. Um, but we can tell the economics based on the opium cans. You see that one that we found out at Ome Bay. We can say what its price is. Most opium cans are more mid-level. They're not pricey. But that can in 1870 cost $15. When your wage labor for a month was 30. So again, this is not you personally buying this can. This is communal purchase, communal use. An opium smoke is the size of a BB. 
So you can get a lot of BBs out of that can. So this is, again, it was meant to be consumed in a group. Or that's why opium dens existed at all, is because they are the ones that could afford to buy the supplies. Uh, Source of Beauty is the most common brand. That is your working class man. That is your, that is your target brand. It's not Walmart. It's not Whole Foods. It's kind of right in the middle. There's your opium smoking paraphernalia, usually a two to three foot bamboo or wood uh, pipe. Uh, and then the pipe bowl on top, which was usually ceramic. There is the same store in Oregon showing those things right as the, the Chinese storekeeper left them. Pipe stem replacements and pipe bowl replacements. We don't have enough information right now to understand what was a, a pricey pipe bowl and a cheap price bowl. We just don't have those records right now. But just looking at that tray as it goes around, one of those has a, the Chinese Zodiac on the base. I would typically probably tip that towards the pricier end. So that's some of the material culture. And I think I got most of it circulating right now. So feel free. If you haven't gotten to it, knock somebody over that does. But at the end of that story, we do have a labor transition. In 1911, the Immigration Commission did a report talking about how the railroads had switched to Japanese labor. 1906, 13,000 Japanese were working on the railroads in the United States, largely the western United States. 10,000 in 1909. So a full fifth of the labor force were of Japanese descent. I've made a lot of deal in here about how the Chinese, we don't know a lot about the Chinese railroad experience. We know even less about the Japanese railroad experience. The Chinese have had a longer uh, microscope on their experiences in the United States, but we're slowly starting to learn more about the Japanese experience because they're different. They are radically different cultures, radically different experiences and backgrounds. So it's going to be an interesting combination to see American capitalists using this labor in the same exact way, but the two cultures being completely different. This is a lucky little find. This is on state trust lands. I found an old site form from 1979. It said, Chinese, down by Milford. I'm like, nope. But I'll take a look. So I went down there and hopped the railroad track, parked the car behind a sand dune, ran across, um, checked it out. Within five minutes, Japanese artifacts. So the San Pedro, Los Angeles, and Salt Lake Road was constructed and maintained by Japanese from about 1900 to about 1915, 1916. So this is actually a work camp of Japanese workers. And so I'm interested to start pulling some of these stories together. That's also on the site. That is a super cool railroad tie dugout. You can still walk in that baby. It's awesome. I'm surprised there wasn't a couple dead cows stuffed into it. Um, wishful thinking, I suppose. But because it's been on state trust lands on the backside of a railroad grade that has a giant no trespassing sign, it's actually fairly intact. You know, these things, if it was out in the West Desert, probably would have been burned up a long time ago for firewood. Uh, so I'm pretty excited to continue both the Chinese aspect, but also underst understanding a little bit of the Japanese experience that was a little bit later. Yes, Ray? You know, were, were there similar political upheavals in Japan that were pushing Japanese out at that time? Not as dramatic as the Chinese, but lots of internal social discord, a lot of unemployment, a lot of opportunity issues. And so, yeah, it was a similar push. Chase probably knows more about Japanese history than I do. Yeah, Janice? You were talking about they imported a lot of stuff Mm -hmm. Who was, who, what companies were doing it? Was it Chinese companies that were importing it? Yeah, Chinese companies would be importing it largely on American shipping. And so the, the Chinese secret societies that were banned in China because they were anti-government, in San Francisco and Hong Kong, they were the merchants. They were doing the import-export. So they were doing the labor, they were doing supplies. And San Francisco, the six companies, is really an amalgamation of six of these secret societies that were formed to overthrow the Qing government, but also create mutual aid for the Chinese overseas. And so they had a lot of that shipping relationship. Because in Qing China, uh, they saw merchants in a Confucian ideal as the worst human, because they are out for profit. So in a Chinese mainstream society, merchants had very little power, very little social respect. Flip that over to America, that's what everybody wants to be. They want to make it rain. And so it's, a, it's an interesting switch. They saw themselves as developing value. By yeah. yeah, 1892, the six companies actually filed a lawsuit against the federal government on behalf of the Chinese immigrant. The Qing government didn't. 
the secret society with all the power and money did assassinating